Okay, this is the official beginning. Did you catch that? That was good. I've worked it into the whole routine now. <laughs> so glad to see all of your faces. Thank you for returning. I'm glad that we haven't said or done anything that has driven anyone away permanently. So uh, let's pray for the Lord's presence. And, well, it, it will be here. He already promised that way back in the first chapter, right? Father, we're really grateful that we have the freedom to gather and to hear your word. We're just awestruck by the images in this book, in your word. And uh, we again claim the blessing to those who read and those who read aloud and keep the words of this prophecy. So open our, by your spirit, carry the this your word to our hearts and uh, I pray it would make us each a better witness for you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to start with reading the passage and see where that takes us. And really the first page of our handout is kind of preliminary. But because we have six seals to go through, it might take us a little while, but I promise it will be, it'll be worth it. It'll be really, really eye-opening. I hope it is for you as it was to me. So I'm going to ask someone to read the first eight verses. Could someone uh, do that if you brought your Bible with you? Chapter 6. One through eight, and we have our we have our uh, microphone on, so we hope to pick you up as you read. But anyone who would like to, the first eight verses, that is through the fourth seal. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, "Come!" I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth, so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. Paul, would you mind reading from verse 9 to the end? Thanks. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witnesses they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. 
for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And at the top of your handout, you'll see these words. And I, I translated this directly for you from Greek because the drama of the language is so evident here. Hoti elfin he hemera he megale tes orgusatu kaitis dunatai stathenai. Because it came the day, the great one of their wrath, and who is able to stand. It just, just impresses it in your mind what these people at the very end of this chapter, and we'll talk about who those people are, what they have realized. Oh, you know, the, the scales fall off their eyes. They see it happening and realize now the day of grace is over and all we can do is hide ourselves. Getting ahead of myself, but that's why I wanted you to see that translation there in red. So where do we begin to understand this imagery of the first four seals, the four horsemen? Now, see, this is where in Revelation, everything up to this point, you know, may, maybe the living creatures in chapter four make you wonder what is really going on there. But there's the imagery is getting more uh, kind, kind of veiled and the language makes you wonder, am I really understanding what they're trying to say here? But I, I think we can really get there because principle number one, we begin with scripture. scripture this is not the first time, even though I think a lot of people forget, it's not the first time that four horsemen are talked about in scripture. Now, it may not be exactly the same four horsemen, but if you look I'm actually going to read this for you from Zechariah. So if you're brave and want to try to find that book in the Old Testament, because it is buried back there a little ways. Zechariah. I always give a little extra time if we're going to find one of those uh, more obscure books. But Zechariah is one of those books that a lot of this imagery is also in Revelation from the book of Zechariah. But I wanted to read this from chapter 1, verse 8. Surprising. This sounds familiar, but again, it's different. This was prophesying something different. But John, Jesus, through John, is drawing on this. So he says this in Zechariah 1, 8, and I'm just going to read um, about 10 verses. I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. If I had had time, I would tra have translated the Hebrew for you about patrol the earth. But A, I did not ever study Hebrew. B, <laughs> Well, I, I can probably figure it out based on some books I have, but um, uh, I just ran out of time because I, I, I think that is an interesting word. It keeps showing up here, patrolling the earth. Um, and they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? So this is obviously, that's a reference to the captivity. And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said, Cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out again over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So just keep that imagery in mind, because actually, as you progress through Revelation, we'll also see this idea of measuring the temple. I think Ezekiel talked about that. He's talking about it, has some significance. 
as we get further in the book. But um, there's another reference I won't take time to read in the handout there, Job 39, 19 to 25, about horses and how strong horses are in battle. And so obviously they're a very common symbol. But um, in the scriptures, horses tend to be connected with war, conquest, triumph. Um, it doesn't necessarily indicate that they are referring to the, and the blank there is, same events. So Zechariah is talking about the restoration of Israel after the captivity. John's talking about something different, I think broader about all of world history. So they're not referring to the same events, but it helps paint the visual backdrop of what Jesus is trying to communicate here. Somewhat like artists use the same paint and image, but each painting is an entirely unique picture. So that was principle one. We begin with scripture. And then principle two, I love this one because we can learn from history. I am a person who loves history and probably a little too much because I try to give too much of it. You know, a friend, uh, a former boss of mine said once, and he wasn't talking about me, that his father gave so much background that the foreground got buried underground. <laughs> I've never, ever forgotten that. And I tend to do that. He wasn't really, again, saying that about me, but he did say it to me, but not about me. Uh, learn from history. Ask yourself. So I think this is really important. Have we ever known a time in history when the world has not been visited by one or all of these horsemen? I mean, just from reading the text, even if you feel like, well, I don't know what those horsemen are symbolizing, just the language alone, you think... That describes the history of the world. Conquering, one goes forth and conquers, another goes forth and spreads war, then comes disa uh, economic disaster, then comes the last one, death, hate. I mean, this is a cycle over and over again of, of world history. Just pick up a history book, pick up a newspaper. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. As long as the world is allowed to continue on its current course by the one on the throne and the lamb who has the seals, these horsemen will ride the earth. So I, I do not believe personally that because chapter six does not start with, you know, any indication that this is some future thing. That this is happening in John's vision in what I would say real time, meaning something to him. And he could immediately tell you what these horsemen were doing at the time of the Roman Empire. He had seen all of it. It's not insignificant that a couple of years after John wrote Revelation, the Roman emperors changed again from Domitian to, I can't remember the name of the fellow who followed Domitian, but just a couple of years later. And then persecution would continue against Christians for several hundred more years until Constantine finally in 320 something uh, made Christianity the state religion and the persecution let up. But interesting to read that there are historians who think there were 10 major persecutions of Christians from about the time John wrote, wrote Revelation to uh, the time that the Roman Empire made Christianity the state religion which we're, not still, we're still not sure if that was ever a good idea, by the way, because of what eventually happened to Christianity when it married itself to the Roman Empire and resulting in, well, in many ways, in what you still see in the Catholic Church as far as the um, leadership structure. But I don't say that to, to imply that Revelation is talking about the Catholic Church. That, that is a very, uh, was a very major line of thinking for many years. Uh, but other than similarities, you know, of what happened, I'm sorry about that, what happened when, uh, or what happens when people seize control and power and the structure of a pope and cardinals matching the makeup of the Roman Empire. Um, that's all I'm saying. There are some interesting similarities there. Um, but I have many, many people I know who are in the Catholic faith who love the Lord. So uh, bad as these are, bad as these horsemen are, this is that next blank, they do not indicate final judgments.
And I truly believe that. These are not final judgments. They are precursors to the final day. And it's probably not a secret. You can tell that as these progress, when you get to seal number six, we are pretty close to the final day. But even then, it's, it's not quite yet here. It is just beginning in seal six. Um, principle three, and I'm jumping ahead uh, to the next couple pages. We balance our approach. So this is just some advice I would give anyone reading Revelation. Number one, do not overread details. That is one extreme people go to is overread the details. Well, the red means this on the horse. The, the crown on the head means that. The robe means this. The hoofs on the horse could mean X, Y, Z. You, you could re- it's something we talked about when we first started. A principle of uh, interpretation of the Bible is don't allegorize or symbolize. Don't make everything a symbol. So that's the first principle. Uh, don't allegorize the meaning away, which is another extreme. Uh, Don't assume the visions have meaning only at some future or even past date. That's, again, my caution with we take Revelation and start matching up certain people in history who must be the Antichrist. You know what? I think there's a lot of people you can go back and map to who were definitely Antichrist. And everyone wants to know, but who is the Antichrist? And remember... The word Antichrist does not occur in the book of Revelation. It occurs in 1 John over and over and over and over again. And he even tells us who is Antichrist. Now, is there a main character who will be the epitome of all of that together at some point in the future? Maybe. Maybe so. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, Remember, although not recognized by those who do not know the Lamb, each of these four only, let me say that sentence kind of slowly because it's written kind of weird. I apologize for that. Remember, although those who don't know the Lamb don't recognize this, that's another way I would say it. Each of these four horsemen only come or go. The Greek word is erku. Erku can mean come it can also mean go. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know why the Greeks would choose one word to mean both, but they did. And uh, I think a really good translation in this passage is be going. Rather than come, it's be going, like they're going out. Because you notice all these horsemen are riding out. Um, but they, they only go when the lamb opens the seal. They are under his ultimate control although allowed to roam while the earth remains. And by saying that, I don't at all mean to imply in any stretch that that God is the author of sin or the author of slaughter or the author of any of these things that are mentioned here. These, These are all the doings of human beings. You know, this is the worst humans can get, these things that we're going to see. And so I would, I would really caution anyone from assuming from this passage that that means um, the Lord initiates a war or stops a war. I mean, I think there is obviously a principle of God's providence at op- in operation here. But we from this side of heaven can't know for sure <laughs> what exactly where his hand is. And I think the point of this chapter is not so much to show that detail, but that his purpose will not be thwarted because chapter seven is coming. Now, if you looked ahead, (laughs) it's very exciting, but chapter seven is coming, but it only follows what happens here. So let us go to the first writer. So, uh, next page of the handout. A rider on a white horse. Now, the language here is he had a bow, he has a crown that was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, there are a lot of scholars who will say this is 
<clears throat> excuse me, clearly a reference to Christ himself. That would be the blank there. It's Christ himself. It's the white horse. It's the crown. He's riding forth. He's conquering. The word conquer is always used with Jesus' believers and Jesus himself in Revelation. It's got to be Christ himself. And, and that's a respectful view. And I think this is where I will say this. Yes. Based on that understanding, and then the next horsemen come in reaction to that, that Christ going forth and, the, in other words, the gospel being preached, often ushers in the next horseman, persecution of Christians, and then injustices against Christians. But then you have the fourth horseman that those who believe this particular way would say that is war in general. So that's just one perspective I wanted to put out there for you. I, I respect and understand why people would believe that. And it's totally fine if someone accepts that because it's true. You know, the white horse is symbolic of purity and all of that. But I'll get to, and my last point, where I tend to lean in terms of interpretation. So second bullet point, some relate the writer to Christ himself and, com and compare Revelation 19, which is the one we will read eventually about, you know, the fully developed picture of Jesus on the white horse. And number th bullet three, number three, the lesson may be that Christ rides forth into the earth, I think I just said this, through the preaching of the gospel. And you know, and I can go there, I understand that, and that the three successive horsemen logically follow. In other words, as the gospel is proclaimed, his followers are subjected to the events portrayed by those next three horsemen. Sorry, that was a bit of a repeat. Uh, but the problem that I have with that interpretation suggests that the, other th that the other three horsemen only affect Christians. That's the blank there. And I don't think history bears that out. Um, and it isn't clearly logical that Christ would be the subjects of one of the seals opened up by the Lamb. Okay? He, he could be. But it, it doesn't seem to fit to me that the lamb who is representing Jesus is opening a seal that is about himself. So it could be. I think my explanation is better. I'll tell you why. Um, but, oh, but before I get there, we have to do another one. Uh, another interpretation states that this writer is a false Christ, a false messiah. And, uh, and so you go to Matthew 24, where Jesus said that before the end come, many, you know, many will come in my name saying, um, lo, Christ is there, lo, he is there, don't believe any of them. Um, and it's very true that God's people will be plagued, that's the next blank, by false Christs, sorry, that's a little repetitive, um, until his return. And there's a lesson there, for sure. Could be a false Christ. The other thing to keep in mind, though, and this is where we'll go to the last bullet point, is in Roman and Persian history, the rider on the white horse, this is what someone who has just conquered does when they parade themselves back through the streets of Rome or, or the capital city. They're on their white horse. They, they have all of their enemies behind them. You know, and there's, you see this symbolism later in Revelation, too, with Jesus. Um, Everyone that they've captured is behind them, and it is a way of showing they are the ultimate conqueror. So on that last point, and this is my view, this writer, dressed as he is and upon a white horse, recollects Roman and Persian conquerors of John's day and refers to the constant flux of political power throughout history. In essence, there will ever be conquerors who ride forth on the earth and take what power they can seize, and it applies to many people throughout history. Um, think for a minute about world leaders even today, political leaders from the past. You know, this is a point where a lot of people want to uh, identify Adolf Hitler as the Antichrist, the absolute worst. And probably doesn't get much worse than him, but there have been many others. And others maybe who were not as... Uh, as absolutely insane as he was, but 
if, if I understand this as throughout world history, there will be conquerors politically over and over. It's going to keep happening until the true rider on the white horse appears. Then these other horsemen seem to make a little bit more sense to me. But again, I respect if you would differ with my uh, thoughts on that. And feel free to ask me a parking lot question about it. I'd be glad to expound more. But we better keep going to the next horses. And number two. So that is on the, on the upper, uh, upper right-hand corner here, the second seal rider on a red horse. Most scholars agree that the rider indicates war or slaughter due to both the color of the horse, red for blood, and I don't think that's overly interpreting the details. I th that's pretty common understanding. And that he is permitted to take peace from the earth. Peace the op is the opposite of war. And that men are slaying one another and that he was given a great sword. That's uh, the Greek word makaira, which actually is a Roman short sword. A makaira. And Interesting use of two different words for sword in this chapter. So we'll get there. So the word used for sword is different than the word in verse 8. The sword here in verse 4 is great because of the constant and terrific slaughter it symbolizes. So it's not a large sword, but it indicates very great number of people being slaughtered. Now, those who believe that the, that the first horseman is Jesus would say this, is the, uh, this red horse indicates the persecution of Christians because of the use of the word slaughter and sacrifice and later because of the martyrs. So that's, that's actually a very good argument. I just think that I don't necessarily restrict this particular horse to Christians only, uh, for the reasons I think I've already said. So note in the reference to the conqueror of the white horse, doesn't war usually follow one who conquers? Well, or war accompanies one who conquers. You know, I'm going to get my power however I want to. So uh, my friend Linsky there on the last bullet point of the second horse says this, wars themselves as signs of the ripening the ripening unto final judgment are a continuous sign of the end. They are like a great placard advertisement, great placard advertisements that are strung along the highway of the world's history. Really a great quote. What was World War I known as? Anyone remember what they called World War I afterward? The war to end all wars. And so World War I ended when? 1918? 1919? 1918? And World War II started when? Yeah, 19, about 1939. Um, you know, it took several years to get heated up and for us to get involved in 1941. But, and then World War II, where we lost more than we had, I, I believe the statistic was, than in any other war come all the other previous wars combined. Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that that second seal is war. The third seal, a rider on a black horse. So again, colors are significant. White, looking like somebody who is a conqueror and is a conqueror. Red, war. Black, um, and carrying scales, talking about Mark, you know, markets. So scales carried by this writer immediately call, call to mind the concept of justice. That's the first blank. And so many people believe, this is number two, that the writer indicates famine. That would be the next blank. Due to the references about the high cost of wheat and barley. Um, that position is challenged a little bit when one, when one considers that we're clearly told that the fourth writer spreads famine as one of his just judgments. So those who really try to 
draw a hard line here, we'll say, well, that can't be what horse number three means because horse number four spreads famine. But I would say when considered in sequence after the first two horses, it makes sense logically, historically, from the meaning of the language that, and this, it, this is a fairly long phrase, sorry, I hope I gave you enough room to write there, economic injustice and hardship follows conquest and war. So, you know, think of the aftermath of war and people trying to get basic necessities. That, that phrase again was economic injustice and hardship. Now, again, we could say you see that happen against Christians all the time. So there is a principle of truth there that as the gospel is spread, the world reacts and they persecute the church. And it takes the form of things like this. I just happen to think that these have a broader application. So the injustice, this is very interesting, I think. The way, you, know, you, you have to ask yourself, what does a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine mean? You go, I don't have any idea what that means. But when we tear it apart, we realize that um, a denarius was a day's wage. So this is somebody who has to work an entire day just for a quart of wheat, just for three quarts of barley so that they can feed themselves and do not harm the oil and wine. I, I believe the oil and wine indicates luxuries. You know, obviously, if we're poor, we don't buy wine and probably can't afford oil. Um, they're only affordable to the rich who seemingly have control over the, over the markets. So I think that's borne out in history. When politics change, when governments change hands, you know, those who are closest to the leaders and in high offices of power always have enough. You know, they're not the ones suffering. <laughs> it's the people down below. So I think that it's pretty fair to say that the use of the scale imagery and the scarcity, well, not scarcity. This is not famine. See, that is the other difference with the, fort, the next seal coming. This is not talking about famine because you can get the wheat and the barley if you have enough money. But could we even say that this is talking about inflation? Well, yes, we could. <laughs> and does that relate to our modern day? I'll let you decide that. You decide that. Um, okay, that was the third seal. We are going through these at a nice rapid pace. And stop me if I have said anything too quickly or if, or if you've, you've missed a blank. So the fourth seal is the writer on a pale. I don't know how many Bible versions say pale um, and how many say green. The Greek word is actually... I had it in my notes. Wait. We actually have to look it up in the Greek. That is verse 8, right? The word there for the color is chloros. Chloros. Does that sound like anything? Chloros? Chloroform? <laughs> or chlora... Um, Chlorophyll, chlorophyll, thank you, not chloroform. <laughs> Don't fall asleep. <laughs> that would be what goes along with chloroform. Chlorophyll, yeah. So it is a green horse, sickly. It's the picture of death, obviously. It even tells us um, its rider was named Death and Hades followed him. So in this case, the imagery is pretty clear. Death would seem to be to naturally occur after conquest, war, and economic hardship. But this writer brings much more. It is, and here's the next uh, blank, a, it is calamitous death that he brings. And there's a passage in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that are interesting parallels here. Uh, let me see if I can find that one real quick for you. Jeremiah 14, 12 says this. 
and I did print that for you there. 14.12 says, Well, the Lord said to me, this is verse 11, do not, pray, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Wow. God telling someone not to pray. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. So I mention that because those are the things mentioned in this passage as well. Then in Ezekiel 14.21 this is even this is a little more pointed. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beasts and pestilence to cut off to cut off from it man and beast. So I think this horseman is kind of bringing all of that together, and that is what follows these previous horses. Um, slaughter, famine, pestilence, disease, and wild beasts are called my four disastrous acts that only, and interesting that only a quarter of the earth is affected, again indicates, see, this is not a final, this is not the final judgment. This is a judgment, but it's not a final judgment. And it's going to repeat itself over and over again. So does he mean, will only a quarter of the people ever experience death on the earth? No. It's just a way, I think, of indicating that, well, number one, death and Hades will never have the final word. Their victory will never be complete. This horseman, sorry to say, Satan, is not going to win the day. So it takes a quarter of the earth in my view, meaning it is always happening. There will always be people dying. But, well, I think you could even go so far as to say there will not be complete annihilation of the human race as long as the one who sits on the throne is there. And I, I think this also gets more further developed in Revelation that that is not the way that God Almighty will let this world end. It will not be through annihilation. Now, you, you can take that however you want, you know, in terms of, well, what about nuclear war and all of the things that might happen, and those things could happen. But remember who's on the throne. What's his name? Putin in Russia will not have the final word. And neither, neither will our people, you know, um, who are responding to him. So, it's not a final judgment. The great day is still coming. So, the great day, so important word, Magale, Mega, Mega. <laughs> That's where we get the word. Magale in Greek is the word for great or large. Um, the great day is still coming. Remember the very last verse of this chapter. This writer also carries a sword. This is the difference I wanted to point out. But it is a romphia as it's called, a great, long, heavy sword attached to a shoulder sling. So think of the Knights of the Round Table and broad swords. That's what this sword is. This is not the Roman short sword, the Machaira. This is the Romphia. It is the same sword. Oh, this is so exciting. The same sword that we are told proceeds from the mouth of the one who sits on the white horse in chapter 19 and whom John saw in chapter 1. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, like a battle sword, because the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Remember that? Rome, uh, Hebrews 4, chapter, 12, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. So the blank there is, it proceeds from the mouth of the one seen in those chapters. Two more seals to go. And then we will break before we do our final section. Um, at the top of the next page, top of the third page, and this is the last page, um, you'll see a picture of a cup. <laughs> that is, a, it's probably not the real cup from the Last Supper, but it is known as the Chalice of Antioch, and it is very, very, very old. And 
the tradition goes that that actually was the cup Jesus used at the Last Supper. But I, I'm a little skeptical that they actually found that cup, like they actually found his robe. Or someone once said, if you took all of the slivers of the cross that are in, the, in all churches across the planet, it would be enough to build a fleet of ships. So just keep that in mind when you... About uh, what do we call those relics? Sometimes religious relics are not quite what they appear to be. However, there are uh, don't also don't overlook. Oh, I don't have time to go into this, but oh, I love history, and you'll suffer through it anyway. <laughs> there are places, though, um, if I may say, if you ever have the chance or read, just read about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, that are very clearly and reliably in the right place in terms of where things would have happened and the size of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, that are likely the location of Calvary and maybe even the empty tomb. But, you know, over so many years and building and rebuilding and tearing down, you can never know that for absolute sure. But they do know that that location, by doing excavation work, um, is pretty reliably determined to be where there was a garden and where there is a rock formation. Um, okay, that you got that for free because that dealt with the, <laughs> that had to do with the chalice there and the Last Supper, but um, relics. So when you look at that cup, and the blank at the top of the page is going to be, the cup of his wrath is not quickly spilled. It is filled slowly and then overflows at last. You know, that's a chilling thought really is, but it overflows at last. And I think of the cup of wrath as all of history's injustices piling up, filling up. His patience is great and his wrath is slow and he is slow to anger, but when it comes, it overflows and no one can stop it. What do they say in the very last verse of this chapter? It's at the top of that worksheet. It came the day of the day, the great one of their wrath, and who is able to stand? Chilling. Fifth seal, martyrs. That is in the upper right hand of page of or corner of the page. Martyrs under the altar. Now, this is not one that is cloaked in so much mysterious language. This is pretty obvious what is going on here. Who are these people? They are those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony they had borne. Now, note that they were under the altar. And compare the verse there I want you to write in is Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. And would someone like to bravely go hunt for that verse and read it? You might wonder why I, why I put that in there, but it is a beautiful correlation. Leviticus, believe it or not, Leviticus <laughs> even has some relevance to Revelation. Leviticus 4, verse 7. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense <coughs> before the Lord that is in the tent of the meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a subtle reference to the precious blood of the saints is under the altar, put there just like the priest would throw the blood of the bulls against the base of the altar. It's a place of honor, actually. And then I wonder, are they crying out for vengeance for themselves or for the great day to come? It's easy to misinterpret this. They are crying to God to send the, to send the final judgment they're talking about him avenging himself, not so much, hey, we died for you. When are you going to take care of all this and, and make things right for us? No, it really is. Uh, the, the direct translation of the Greek is, until when, master, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on those dwelling on the earth? Yeah, the word avenge is there, but it's about him avenging himself, 
because of how horribly his people have been abused and treated and slaughtered in history. Uh, and then it's just so beautiful. The incomparable beauty of his, of his answer is, first, he, he doesn't even say anything. He gives them a gift, a white robe. The Greek word for robe is stole, a white robe. He then tells them to rest a little while. And then he answers the question. How long? Well, until the number of their fellow slaves and brothers who were to be martyred as they were, as they were, is complete. That's the next blank. Now the word complete there is, is also translated fulfilled or full. It, it, he's just such a merciful God. And uh, Linsky said there, this is that fourth bullet point, last blank. It is indeed a striking point and exceptional in every way that God delays. That's the blank. He delays the final judgment until the world has killed off so many martyrs. Now, I don't know. You probably don't either. What that secret number is. When does he say? Enough is enough. It's fulfilled. Because it hasn't happened yet. Because we haven't seen the sixth seal yet. But he knows when that is. But you ha we have to remember, you know, the passages like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Slow, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing what? For any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is the one thing that holds back his hand, is that desire to have every person come into the fold. Um, oh, yes, and it, it is really significant. This is the last point there on fifth seal. That the sixth and seventh seals are opened after the martyrs appear. And it's... It, it just makes me bow my head that those two last seals are, in essence, the answer to the prayer of the martyrs. And we're going to see it. So it's that fifth seal of the martyrs is in the absolute perfect place between all of the pressures and the horsemen coming and fighting against God's people. And yes, other people on earth are affected. But and before there's the opening of the last of the sixth seal. And we're going to see in a minute, we could almost call the sixth seal the seal of man because of who is affected. Unredeemed man, but man. Um, so he answers this. This is going to be his answer. And when you get to chapter seven, you see there's a great, a great pause happening. It's almost like in the movie, not this movie, but in a movie, hitting the pause button. Wait a minute. Open the sixth seal. And before you get to see what is happening in the seventh seal, hold it a minute. We have to praise the Lord for a whole chapter. <laughs> kind of back in the spirit of chapters four and five. Okay, the sixth, sixth seal, and then we are going to take a break and come back and let you see the rest of this. A glimpse of the end. We should immediately be, dra be drawn to other complementary passages of Scripture about this terrifying day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. The, the beginning of it. Just a glimpse of it. And I gave you a lot of Scriptures there. Take a look at the... I'd love to take time to read all of those, but um, read Matthew 24. That's Jesus' discourse about the second coming. Thess 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire. I mean, Paul actually used that word, those words, in flaming file, fire, to deal out retribution. Clearly saying that Jesus is coming the second time to save his people, but to judge. And Revelation is Jesus the judge. And 2 Peter 3, 10, I give you some Old Testament passages there. And I made a little comment that is important. These are indeed passages that have had, that had direct application to Israel and judgment on their enemies of old, but resonate with a double meaning 
You can squeeze in the words double meaning in that little blank when taken in the context of the final day of the Lord. So it's just like God to have, you know, throughout all the Old Testament, these prophecies that when God spoke to Zechariah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of those prophets, it immediately had to do with Israel's history. But I think there's a lot that still applies to what he will do at the very, very end when he rescues his true church from captivity on, the, on earth. There is a double meaning. So we see in verses 12 to 17 in this seal what the day of the Lord means to those who have rejected him. Verses 12 to 17 and this seal is not about Christians. Anyone disagree? This is not about Christians. This is about from the greatest of the, and the, the greatest and smallest, kings of the earth, great ones, generals, rich and powerful, everyone, slave and free. Now, if you stretch that a little bit, you can almost count six categories of people. And later on in the book, we are told that the number 666 is the number of man. Some say it's the number of a man, like a single man, a single individual. But there are those who believe it's simply indicating because 666 is always falling short of seven, of perfection, right? So just kind of an interesting tidbit that there are, you know, you can, you can read six categories of people here. Um, and so it will take an entire chapter chapter 7, to reveal the magnificent destiny of his people and what this day means for them. This is the majestic interlude that, last blank, must precede the final seventh seal. So you don't get to the seventh seal until chapter 8. And whenever I've taught this book before, Revelation before, I've always thought of, well, the sixth seal ends at the end of chapter 6. But if I remember that John did not write this book in chapters, okay, <laughs> those were put in way later, really you could make the argument that all of chapter 7, which if you just take it a minute and look and see, it's all about the 144,000 of Israel sealed, it's about a great multitude from every nation, and those are obviously saved people, God's people. That actually is like the B-side. You all See, you all would know what I mean by that, wouldn't you? You know what the B-side is <laughs> of a record, a vital record. Yeah, um, but the B-side is what happens in chapter 7. Here is what those who rejected God are seeing on this day of the Lord. Who can stand? Chapter 7 is about what those of us who know him will see. It's just, it just makes you want to fall on your face. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that the sixth seal really could encompass all of chapter seven because you don't see the seventh seal open until chapter eight. And then I want you to ask yourself as we prepare to get there, where the trumpets come in, because those are going to come next, but not until after the seventh seal. So much so that you could say, okay, there'll be a test on this next week, that the seventh seal includes the seven trumpets, the seven trumpets. I just said that, I'm sorry. Um, and I haven't, haven't refreshed my memory enough on that to tell you any more, so you'll just have to come back in a couple of weeks, okay? So I think that is where I would like to stop for tonight and let you see. Actually, there's one last thing before we uh, take a break, and then we'll come back, and there's about a five-minute clip I want to show you to conclude. Uh, I understand that the, there's a women's Bible study that meets in this room. 
and recently studied Jericho and the conquering of Jericho. Am I right, Amy? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and what is so beautiful about that is, and maybe this is something to read, take, home, take this home. Read Joshua 6 this week because I have ne I've never put this together until I was talking to someone who is in the Bible study class. <laughs> um, but I read Joshua 6 this week in reference to these seven seals and realized that, did you know that there were seven priests with seven trumpets marching seven times around the city of Jericho? And for seven days, they did this. And on the seventh, you know the story, and on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. Every other day, it was once. And then on the seventh, on the final time, they blow the trumpets, the people shout, the walls fall down. But even that is a picture of the patience of God. Because I wonder, well, what if someone from Jericho had come out and repented in the first six days? What would Israel have done? Would they have, say, would they have accepted them? I think they would have. Um, it's just a very patient, long warning before final destruction. It's just like the seal, you know. The sixth seal is, it's over. It's happening. We're done. The number of martyrs is complete. The earth is over. But uh, this was a quote I thought was just beautiful. Jericho was not a divinely sponsored genocide, but a 40-year justice. Because those people in Jericho had heard what God had done in Egypt, saving Israel. And remember, Joshua didn't get across the river and go conquer Jericho till after the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So all of the reports and the stories about what God had done for the Israelites had been circulating in that area for, years, for decades, and yet there was still no repentance. And if you ever wonder what the culture of the uh, Canaanite people was like, just, just do a little research on that. It was horrid. It was horrific. Well, I'm going to let us break for five minutes. That'll give me a minute to get this set up. And then I want you to see their interpretation of the four horsemen. It's actually not bad. But now that you know the real truth, we can watch this one, okay? Well, <coughs> they do a very good job, I think. It's very, very full of imagery. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can be on your side, not because of our doing, but because of yours. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And that one day we will be with you in that heavenly city. We are just awaiting that day and those who wait for us there. Thank you for our time tonight and for the glorious truth of your word in Jesus' name. Amen.